Okay, so these are our notes on rate of reaction. So if you haven't opened your Cornell template yet, please go to classroom, click on classwork. It'll be in unit seven. Okay, and then scroll down to find rea reaction rate notes. And then your copy of your um, Cornell notes should be here. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay. All right, rate of reaction. So we're gonna talk about a couple different things um, that can cause the reaction to go faster, okay? All right, so the essential question for our notes here is how do we change the rate of a chemical reaction? So if we need it to go faster, what can we do? And you might have seen that um, with when I did the water reaction with a decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So we're gonna, um, talk about a couple things. All right, so let's review. Some of this is from last semester, so I just wanna go over it a little bit more. If you remember from when we talked about gas laws. So as you increase the pressure of a gas, you increase the number of collisions. Remember, as we increase that pressure, okay, that means the molecules are hitting the sides more often, okay? And that means they're also colliding with each other more. So the number of collisions the particles have with each other are also increasing. Remember we talked about pressure and number of collision is a direct relationship. Pressure and temperature are direct and pressure and volume are indirect. That means with collisions, if we increase that temperature, we're gonna increase the collisions. And you'll see me talk about that um, today. Okay, couple definitions as we go through. We're gonna learn about what we call the activated complex. That's the top of a potential energy graph right up here, the very hill. You might have seen something that looks like this in biology with enzymes. The point where there's an, it is the point where there's enough energy for the first chemical reaction to begin. begin. So we have to get up to that point to get that reaction to even start. We have surface area, that's the exposed area of reactants, and you'll see more of that in the lab. Mixing, we stirring or shaking reactants. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of the reactants. Remember when we talked about kinetic energy? Now temperature is a measure of how much energy they have. And then concentration, that is the amount of reactants or atoms in a mixture, how much stuff we have. All right, so one of the biggest concepts here in rate of reaction is collision theory. What is it? Um, to have a reaction occur, atoms must collide with each other. We can't mix them and cause a reaction unless they are actually colliding with each other to cause those bonds to change, okay? And so when they collide, they must have enough energy or get up to that activated complex to cause the reaction to occur. So example, making the water demo, right? I had the hydrogen and the oxygen inside the balloon, but I had to add energy on the fire to make that reaction occur. And that got it up to that activated complex. How do we change the number of collisions then? If we want the reaction to occur, how can we make it occur? Um, the first one is what we call surface area. Basically, we spread things apart. Maybe we crush them, spread them apart. So you increase the surface area of reactants, more area for atoms to collide. Sometimes we will crush them. You'll see me crush them in the lab. Or you can dissolve them in water as well. Mixing, increase the collisions of reactants by stirring and making them closer to each other. So you notice without stirring, it's a slower reaction. They're kind of farther apart. There's some that have settled down here. But when we stir it, we can actually cause that to happen. So you might see when you're cooking, right? When you stir it, you see their chemical reaction or things start to mix. Another thing that affects it is temperature. If we increase the temperature, we're gonna increase the number of kinet, the increase the kinetic energy. Remember that kinetic energy is about how, mu how many times they move back and forth and fly all over the place. So if they are doing that, if they have more energy, then they are going to collide more. So we can increase the temperature. They get hot, they start moving faster. Um, we can also change the concentration. So here's an example of concentration, increasing the amount of reactants in a container increases the collision. So you can see we have this many here, but if we increase the collision, we have so many more, and so it's more likely that they will collide, okay? We can also deal with the pressure. 
Remember, if we squeeze it down, we change that volume, we're going to have more pressure and they're closer together. So pressure can actually increase the um, number of collisions, okay? Energy, adding energy increases the movement of the atoms, which increases the collisions of atoms, which we add in heat or changing that temperature again, okay? We can also do something called add a catalyst. And so this was the concept you were introduced in biology that enzymes are like a catalyst. Enzymes actually make this activated energy come down and that's what a catalyst does. So like when I did the decomposition of water or decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, I added a catalyst to make it happen faster. It would have taken a while. We would have watched it a really long time to fill up that balloon. Um, so I wanted it to happen fast, so I added that catalyst and it brought that ener the energy needed down and it happened very fast, okay? So a substance that assists a reaction to occur, not a reactant or a product of the reaction. So it wouldn't be written in the reaction. So you notice when I did the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, I did not put potassium iodide in there because it did not actually react or mix with the hydrogen peroxide. What does it do? It lowers the activation energy needed or the activated complex, okay? Reactants can reach the activated activation complex quicker. Example, decomposition hydroperoxide, which I just talked about when I added the potassium iodide, okay? This is what you've been seeing, and I'm going to go over a little bit about a graph. You will need to know how to read these graphs. So, this is the activated complex. It is the top of the hill. This is where there's enough energy for the reaction to start. You have activation energy, how much energy to get a reaction started. That is A. So it starts here at the reactants. It's at 100. And we have to get to 400 to make the reaction begin. So I have to add 300 joules of energy okay, to go from 100 to 400. C is the, what we call the heat of reaction. So it's the change of heat when we go from re reactants to products. You can have a positive one or a negative one. I'll show you when you actually get a negative one. This one actually is positive. We go from 100 to 300. So the heat of reaction is 200. So how do you determine if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic? Remember when we talked about last semester, we talked about endothermic takes on energy, which means we're going to have more energy in the reaction, or exothermic, it gives it off, there's going to be less. So this is an example of endothermic. See how we added energy to go from reactants to products. So this change in energy, or as I just showed you, oops, we're going to go back. Okay, the heat of reaction, C, okay, is positive. We added some energy. Here in B, this is exothermic, okay? We lost energy. We went from a higher energy to a lower. So this would be exothermic. It's giving it off, okay? So if your heat of reaction, C, here, is positive, then it is endothermic, means the energy level went up. You can also see on this graph you end higher than where you started. So the products are higher in energy than the reactants. If your heat of reaction is negative, okay, then it is exothermic. Notice the reactants are higher and the products. So you would do the heat of the products minus the reactants. So here you would get a negative. This is exothermic. We lost energy to the environment, okay? Now, how do you determine if the reverse reaction is endothermic or exothermic? Well, here, what you would do is, if your reaction is endothermic, then your reverse, go back, is exothermic. It's just the opposite, okay? And if your beginning reaction is exothermic, then it is endothermic <coughs> on the way back. Notice, if I go back to the graph, again, my products will be lower. <coughs> if we go backwards, this would now be my reactants. They would be lower and my products would be higher. So that's why this would be endothermic. So it's basically just the opposite, okay? 
All right, so as I said, reverse reactions, this one would be exothermic and B would be endothermic. All right, so that is our rate of reaction notes. Go back, highlight any important notes, make connections to any of your notes in the left-hand column, write any questions you may have in the left-hand column, and use your highlights, connections, and questions for your summary. And then I want you to write a three to five sentence summary before you turn it in. If you have any questions, please let me know.